Hello, welcome to question 49 of the Secunda Secunde. The topic for this lecture is the quasi-integral part of prudence, and I am Dr. Kiva. So uh, when we're looking at prudence, we've already looked introduced prudence in chapter and uh, question 47, uh, then considered the parts of uh, prudence, which was question 48. And of the, the parts of prudence, there were three distinct groups of parts of prudence. Uh, the first group was the quasi-integral parts of prudence, the, the parts that are just about necessary right there. And integral parts would be necessary, they're quasi-integral, so they're just about necessary parts of prudence. So uh, all of them together become important, necessary for prudence the way uh, could suppose a house could exist without a roof, uh, perhaps it could exist without a wall or two, perhaps it could exist without a floor, but if you miss too many of these things, you, you don't have a house any longer, <laughs> right? Uh, it, they, they are the parts, but they also are rather necessary. Uh, so we've already looked at this slide before in question 48, but uh, just it out there again. This, these are these eight parts which we will discuss. Uh, those integral parts of justice. So uh, when we look to the different integral parts, remember the, the first two uh, kind of go together. The next two, and then the, the final. Uh, the, yeah, the first two, the second two, and the last four go together. So the the first two. Uh, memory is an integral part of prudence. So if prudence is about uh, seeing ahead, seeing what's coming down the road, um, balancing out the virtues in order to uh, have the right proper mean uh, to activity, uh, you have to be able to have some sense of practical uh, knowledge. It has to be a practical knowledge there. And uh, where, where does this practical knowledge come from? Well, some of it comes from memory, which is uh, to remember the past, right? to, to know the past. Uh, it helps us to predict the future when we have a, a balance of knowing the past and the present. Right? So prudence regards contingent matter in, in, of actions. Um, right? That's the law of prudence. Right? In specific cases, contingent matters aren't universal. They're particular. Um, Matter so individual matter so in this particular situation can you trust this person in this particular situation you know do you go this way or that way well what you do will probably be based upon a lot to do with the past has it worked in the past uh, have you learned anything from past experiences of dealing with something similar well these are all very important parts right in dealing with the past. Regards things that are not necessary, necessarily drunk, but uh, which occur in the majority of cases. Uh, somehow I don't suspect that that term was drunk. <laughs> Regards things which are not necessarily, uh, ne not necessary, um, but which uh, occur in the majority of cases. Let me just check that one more time. Okay, are things which are not necessarily true. Nothing like the word drunk. <laughs> but which occur in a majority of cases, um, right? So we're dealing with particular matters, we're dealing with singularities, not universals. Uh, experience is the result of many memories, according to Aristotle's metaphysics. Right? When we talk about experience, we're talking about not one thing, but uh, you know, all of our memories kind of put together and kind of create a certain amount of wisdom now, four things uh, people uh, do to perfect uh, in their memory. Uh, kind of an interesting one. If anyone's doing this in class, this would be an interesting type of conversation, right? This would be good discussion material, uh, whether or not the science has backed this up or not. But to, to help uh, perfect your memory, uh, this memory is so important for prudence, uh, pictures help. Right. Uh, St. Thomas says, uh, suitable but unwanted wanted illustrations. Unwanted are unusual, not common. Right? If you just draw a picture of a, a tree, I'm not sure that's going to be helpful. But if you can 
picture, you draw a picture of something uh, useful, then maybe. So artwork uh, helps us to remember uh, the past. Well, the church is certainly good at this, right? How do we not forget the past? Um, you know, one of the great sin of the Old Testament is people forgetting, right? Uh, uh, that's an important, important thing. Even the Eucharist, whenever you do this, do this in remembrance to me. That, that word remembrance is very important because the, the great sin of people is that they forget, right? It's a forgetting of the past, forgetting of what God has done for us over the, over the generations. Every generation will, you know, seems to forget uh, what God had done from the, from the previous generation. Um, you know, but we kind of remember it. Eucharist, but we also remember it every time we go into church. You know, you look around, you know, what in the windows you see the biblical narratives or lives of the saints, you see stations of the cross to recall the passion, you see the cross to recall the passion, you see the tabernacle front and center, right? Um, you see statues of the saints to remember, right? It's all about remembering. Don't forget right? a prudent person can remember. Uh, and, and this is very practical within the lives of the saints, right? The, um, you know, the, the Bible, in some sense, the Orthodox Church, uh, of the everyday people is, the, is to imitate the lives of the saints. That's really, you know, the, the path of holiness is to imitate the lives of the saints in our, in our everyday lives. Right? Uh, we might not all be scripture scholars or uh, theologians, but, you know, imitate the saints. Uh, that's what we, that's what we can do. Um, you know, they are icons of Christ uh, in the world. So uh, very important to keep these images uh, to help us remember. Right? Very important. Now it's also uh, care. One must be careful to consider and set it in order. That's also an important thing. You know, either you know, we also do this a lot within church things. You know, we have the sacraments. We, have, we can break them down into the sacraments of initiation, the sacraments of healing, uh, the sacraments of uh, commissioning, uh, of service, right? Well, we, we have to order them. Right? The, the whole Summa is dedicated to this idea of ordering, right? St. Thomas could have just written about everything, you know, from a free state of mind, but there's a certain value in that it being properly ordered into questions and articles and responses and, re and responses to responses and objections, right? Uh, this is all very helpful because it's properly ordered. It helps us keep things in mind. Like the Ten Commandments help us, right? not just commandments, the Ten, right? Uh, these things help us a lot when we particularly are trying to learn learn them. Um, so, um, you know, the liturgical calendar is another thing. Right? You know, it's not su a surprise when Easter part of the liturgical calendar. Uh, now, um, also to be anxious and earnest about it. Now, this one would be interesting if the psychology uh, keeps this uh, firm or not. You know, when you're anxious, do you remember things better? Well, perhaps in some ways you do, right? Um, you know, if you know it's on the test, you pay attention more than if you know it's not on the test you know, as a student, um, you know. Pay attention to what's important. Right? So, so a certain degree of earnestness and anxiety about it might be useful. Too much, a person might just shut down. So it might be, uh, maybe psychology today tells us the proper balance of anxiety is necessary. And also the last one I think is very important. Often, often reflecting on the things that we wish to remember uh, is important. So, you know, meditation, reading scripture, you say, well, I've read scripture, right? I read the gospels, I don't need to do it again. Well, read it again, right? Read it again and read it again. And meditate on it. So when we reflect on it, uh, we remember it, right? Uh, we remember it better. Um, so we do this a lot with grudges, right? We think over the grudges over and over again. So we don't forget the grudges, but do we remember and think over and over again and reflect on Good things, right? virtuous things. Uh, that would be nice. Uh, and I hope we understand.
understanding. So again, the first two go together. Memory um, uh, is the past, and understanding uh, is the present. So understanding uh, is important. So uh, since prudence is right reason applied to action, the whole process of prudence must have its source in understanding. Right? How can you prudent about what you should do if you don't even know what your current situation is. <laughs> That's very important. Uh, doctor I knew said that the most important thing about being a doctor is uh, proper diagnosis. Your bedside manner doesn't really matter. You know, a lot of things don't matter if you don't have proper diagnosis, which is the most important thing. That proper diagnosis is understanding in the present moment. Uh, so that's a very important uh, part of this. Um, the first principle um, of demonstration, not the intellect power, but uh, the right estimate. Uh, again, this is important. It's not about being the smartest person, right? A, a prudent person is not necessarily the one with the most book knowledge. They, they might not know the most languages. They might not know, um, you know, the greatest amount of history, right? uh, think of somebody who has that kind of practical wisdom about them, that practical knowledge, that prudence, you know, it, it's the it's the mensch uh, from British, right? it's the wise grandma, the mensch, uh, the mensch on a bench, uh, you know, they're very wise, even though they might not necessarily be book, book smart. Um, so it's not about simply intellectual power. Sometimes the smartest people are the least prudent people. Those are the most unethical people, the smartest people. But um, being uh, smart in wisdom, um, having the right estimate, um, it comes uh, also in two form, two, twofold understanding. The first is universals, and the second is singulars. Now, uh, in uh, question forty-eight, what they focus on on the singulars, but St. Thomas is bringing up both as necessary. So okay, how do you have proper understanding in, form, in terms of universals? Well, you should know universal wisdom, right, in some regard. If you don't know the Ten Commandments, then those are universals, right? You should, right? You should know the Beatitudes. You should know um, the general precepts uh, of things. Focus on faith, hope, and love. You know, the basics of the faith, the basics of the situation, um, in a universal sense, right? You should understand principles. But in, in addition, and this is where it comes in more importantly, is can you apply those to particular cases, the singulars, the in, this individual specific situation has only happened this one time in this time in this place with this particular group of people, right? Uh, in this exact situation, you can't say, well, in the past, this is what they did. Well, this is a unique situation, right? So because it's a unique situation, you can't simply apply a universal to it. This is a singular, but can you find a way to use the ver universals to inform the way in which you can approach the singulars? A prudent person can, because they have understanding, right? They understand uh, the principles of the universals and they understand the situation of the singulars and they can make the appropriate connections uh, in that present moment. So that's an, an integral part of, uh, of prudence is that understanding. So again, memory in the past, understanding in the present. Now these next two is uh, how do you get this information? How do you get this, this uh, prudence? Uh, the first is docility, which uh, does Docil, 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 docility. I keep on saying docility, but it's, it's not how it's said. <laughs> docility. Um, you know, the, this can often be not understood in the same sense today. We tend to think of it as meaning very passive. Right? Uh, even if you look it up in the dictionary today, it usually has an ability to be an understanding that you submissive, right? One is docile, right? A docile dog is a submissive dog. You know, there are docile type of chickens and there are aggressive type of chickens, right? Docile is to be uh, 
peaceful is I, I think the way that we often think of it, but in its uh, appropriate understanding, its older approach, it is somebody who is teachable, moldable, soft enough to be molded, right? Um, Teresa Benedict over the cross talked about this a lot, right? It, it's teachableness, right? Are you are you teachable? Um, prudence uh, is concerned with particular matters of action, and since such matters are infinite variety, no one can consider all of them sufficiently, right? So because you can't, you can never, you know, you can never ahead of time prepare for all of the contingencies all of the particular situations that could possibly occur. There's just too many, right? That you can't have a rule book. Sometimes with ethics, you don't want uh, ethics to be simply a rule book. Well, there, that's nice, but you, you can't possibly have a rule book which would cover every possible ethical situation. Right? <laughs> It has new ethical situations. I know there's a lot that repeats, but uh, nothing is exactly the same. There's different people, a different time, a different place. At a minimum, there's a couple of different accidental differences <laughs> here. Um, you just have to be able to make connections, right? Uh, but to make these connections and to make these decisions, you know, to see the similarities and make uh, appropriate, uh, prudent decisions. It takes time. You can't, you know, you have to think about it. You have to contemplate it. Um, it's not innate. It's something that develops through the intellect and reason. Um, you know, and you can't possibly know everything, particularly when you're younger. Therefore, uh, there's a great need to be taught, especially by old folks, as a, as my translation says, it, old folks. Um, you know who've gone before us can often help teach us what they've learned. Therefore, we don't have to learn it fresh every time, right? Uh, monasteries are wonderful for this because young monks are sitting down at table with older monks, you know, maybe perhaps monks who might be when they were 13 years old and have been in for a long time. You know, there's something for the young monk to learn from the older uh, monk in society in general. So. Are you teachable by people who know more than you? That's docility. That's important. Uh, St. Thomas uses a line from the book of Sirach, stand in the multitude of the ancients. Well, again, I think this is so well with the church, right? And, and then kind of live in an age where there's a focus of self-invention, right? You be whoever you want to be, right? Uh, don't let anyone tell you who you are, right? It's all about self-discovery. But uh, the church points out that there's something to be gained by not standing alone as an individual in every situation, but standing uh, amongst the saints, right? standing amongst uh, the body of Christ. Um, this idea that you have to figure yourself out on your own uh, is you know, it's the next, you know, the next uh, part of virtue deals with figuring it out, you know, shrewdness, figuring it out on your own. But there's something valuable about not doing it on your own, but doing it within a community, particularly a community that's existed a lot longer than you have, and that there's some collective wisdom within that community. Um, you know, people that today very strongly like, well, there's nothing I need to learn from the Bible. There's nothing I need to learn from Thomas Aquinas. There's nothing I need to learn from the philosopher. There's nothing I need to, <laughs> to learn from history. Really? <laughs> right, uh, 24 years old, you have it all figured out and you don't need any of these, um, any of the these, uh, community of the ancients to help you along the way. Interesting. Right? Uh, Interesting approach. So the next one, again, the pairing is docility and shrewdness. Um, as docility, uh, just docility is often has this negative, passive connotation about it. Shrewdness also has kind of a negative connotation today too. Right? The taming of the shrew is not is not a compliment. Right? Uh, it's not a virtue to be called uh, a shrew, uh, but. 
Saint Thomas's writings, he is speaking positively of shrewdness. Right, uh, a solid, a solicitous man is one who is shrewd and alert, according to Saint Isidore. Somebody who's a solicitous person is a person who's asking questions, right? gaining information. Right, but if you're asking questions and gaining information, you have to have certain amount of shrewdness, uh, which is the ability to discern that information you, which you're being told. Right, you know, some people will just read Facebook and whatever their friends on Facebook are reposting, they think it's true. Well, this is because they lacked lack shrewdness. <laughs> shrewdness would say. Uh, Perhaps this isn't true. It sounds a little, a little bit outrageous. You know, I wonder if this is true. Is true. Let me Google it and see. You know, it's, uh, Snoops or something, right? Snoops. Uh, you know, let me see if this is. Let me fact check this information. Let me see if there's anything out there about this. That would be shrewdness, right? Uh, skepticalness of information and uh, looking it up. Shrewdness. Well, that's good, right? We need more people to be looking it up and not just believing whatever their friends are reposting on Facebook, right? This is very important. Uh, and this isn't necessarily a partisanship issue, right? Both sides end up believing um, uh, what's being reposted without being critical enough. Right? Being slightly critical of information you're given is shrewdness, right? It's not to an excess. To properly, as a moral virtue, a mean, right? If you're too shrewd, that's an excess. If you're not shrewd enough, that's a, that's a deficiency. So properly true is the goal. Uh, now, the right estimate or opinion is acquired in two ways, both in practical and speculative matters. Now, this is, again, very similar to uh, the issue with facility, uh, uh, where you have to be able to have principles and then you apply them practically, right? So this is, um, you know, you have certain principles that you are, you know, based on these principles, you have individual actions, you know, singularities. You have to be able to apply universals to singularities, right? This is something which is done by being taught how to do that. And it's also something which is learned through experience. Part of shrewdness. shrewdness is an apt disposition uh, to acquire a right estimate by oneself, right? So facility uh, is to do it with the help of other people, right? to be teachable, to be taught how to do it. This is to find this right estimate, right? This right evaluation of people and situations by oneself. Uh, you figure this out on your own. And lastly, St. Thomas brings this up quite a bit, so I wanted to just make sure I mentioned it, is this eudogia, which is this uh, term of uh, easy and straight path. It's the most accurate translation of it. It's sort of this kind of straightforward way of dealing with it. So how do we get prudence? The most direct way to get prudence is through experience, right? Uh, being taught is wonderful, but learning it on your own is more valuable than being taught. Uh, somebody can tell you that the frying pan is hot, but after you touch the hot frying pan, you know that the frying pan is hot. You, uh, it's, it, it has a sensible element to it, therefore you're not uh, likely to forget it. Right? So there is this, uh, memory is good, understanding is good, uh, being taught, it's good, but direct experience, that's the most straightforward, straight path towards prudence. Now, another part of prudence is reason. And now this is kind of like a umbrella as well. Reason kind of affects the next categories as well, but reason is a bigger, bigger group. Um, the work of prudence is to make good counsel. Right, so good counsel is getting good information, according to Aristotle. So getting good information, uh, you then have to put it into good use. So it is necessary for a prudent person to listen to good counsel and to put it into good use. Therefore, it is integral. Right? 
can get all of the good counsel you like but if you don't command it right if you don't put it into action um therefore it, it's useless right it's, it's not part of prudence if it's not put into it there's a lot of people who know a lot of good things but if they don't act it's not useful right so this is a bit of a short section, but it's really introducing the next sections. So foresight is another part it's related to reason, uh, right reason. And it, it, to properly reason, one must have foresight to uh, of future contingent things, uh, right? Uh, prudence is about making good judgments for certain situations coming up. Prudent person can see all of the ways this could go wrong and all of the ways in which it can go right. Right. A prudent person thinks of all of the possibilities. Um, uh, it's important because it, you, you've never been in that exact time, place, and in, in situation before. Right. Even if you said I've been in in this situation with these people before, in this place before, but never in this time. You know. <laughs> uh, there's a certain contingency within this, and uh, have proper foresight uh, about this would be important. You, you know, you have to have some type of moral imagination, right? You have to be able to imagine what's possible, you know, and to evaluate what's likely uh, from the possible possible uh, consequences. And really, prudence and foresight are very connected, which is an integral part. Prudence, prudentiae, uh, arrives its name from foresight, uh, providentiae. Uh, you can see that there's a similarity, right? Uh, there's a there's something connecting these two ideas that their names are even closely associated with one another. Um, and I'll tie this in for the next one, so I'll continue on. You know, so these last three, they really are tied together a lot, so you can't separate them as much. Circumspection looks at uh, circumstances. Again, they have the, the first six letters, uh, what, seven? First seven letters of their name, circumspection, circumstances are the same, right? You can see that these are connected. Um, so a person who has good circumspection is a good understanding of the circumstances. So. Prudence is about singular matters of action, so many times, uh, which contain many combinations of circumstances. Circumstances com compares uh, the means with, circumspection compares the means within circumstances. So, uh, circumspection, this idea of circum, you know, to go around, doesn't do well when it's kind of green screen behind me to draw my finger, but circumspection, if you think of, you know, all the possible things which could occur. A circumspect person kind of draws a circle around all of the possibilities and kind of try, you know, and then from collecting all of them, they kind of make sense of them and uh, narrow it in, right? You can kind of make sense of it. If you think about it in one way, like let's say uh, there was a Board on the wall, and uh, it was painted on. Right? It's not a separate entity, and people have been throwing darts all these years. And eventually, you, you uh, clean the paint off the wall. Well, you could probably find where the dart board was if you circumspect, right? If you look at all of the the holes in the wall that have been made, you could probably. Some are way out on, on the side, you know, some people aren't even close, but you can see that they kind of focused in in a certain particular area that, you know, they were set, they were focusing in on something, right? That's the circumspection, right? Uh, so all of these circumstances are like all these little dots, right? Holes in the wall from the darts. Right? You have all these dot, darts and, uh, you know, some can be way off to the side, some can be, you know, they can be all over the place. But if you circumspect the situation, you can make sense of the dots. The dots aren't random any longer. They make a pattern of the dot board, right? Even though the lines for the dot board aren't there, you can make sense of it from the from the dots. Um, it's 
my New England accent coming out with that. Um, and and uh, St. Thomas points out, and I think this is important, his response to objection one, um, through the, a number of possible circumstances, although the number of possible circumstances may be infinite, the number of actual circumstances is not. Uh, and I think that's an important part. So if we're not dealing with, you know, could aliens come down tomorrow, right? If I'm, if I'm trying to be prudent, I'm trying to work out with foresight possible uh, situation, circumstances, and how to prevent problems. So you know, for me to be prepared for tomorrow, going to bed early might be useful. Being fed is useful. Powering is useful. I can, you know, saying my prayers before going to bed is useful. Uh, I can have my work prepared ahead of time, so I'll be prepared for tomorrow. Right? There's many things I can do to be prepared. Is it possible that uh, an alien spaceship might come down tomorrow and everything will be changed? It's possible, right? It, it, in terms of the infinite of possibilities, yes, it is possible within the infinite. Right? Might the rapture occur tomorrow? Ethics, we don't believe it. But you know, if the rapture could happen tomorrow, well, it's possible. Um, but it's not really on my schedule. <laughs> it's really not on my plan. So I'm not necessarily caused, not necessarily required with prudence to consider everything which is hypothetically possible. Um, that's not useful. Right? It, it's not a useful thing to have. Um, what would be useful is to be able to know what is more likely, right? What is, the, what is certain, what is likely, what is less likely, what is improbable, what is you know, nearly impossible. And based on that, I prepare accordingly, right? You, you prepare according to what is most likely and you work your way out because there's only so much time and so much preparedness you can have, you know, um, so I'm not going to prepare for, you know, the zombie apocalypse tomorrow because to me that seems pretty impossible, right? So that's not going to be on my list of things uh, to worry about. But there are things that are more likely, and therefore I will prepare for those. So circumspection is kind of drawing in on what is possible in those circumstances. Okay, the last part of... Uh, Prudence is caution. Again, these have a lot, you know, foresight, certain affection, caution. These are very related, right? Um, caution uh, uh, has a particular bend to it. You know, in some ways, caution sounds an awful lot like uh, foresight, which uh, is brought up in the second objection. Uh, and St. Thomas says, yeah, caution and foresight are both good, but they're not the same. <laughs> you know, we kind of very quickly branches that off. Um, caution, what I think Thomas is talking about here is uh, evil often has the appearance of good or evil can be intermingled with good, therefore caution is necessary, right? Uh, you know, you could, you have to be prepared for things that don't, that are not as they appear to be. Um, prudence needs caution so that we have such a grasp um, good as to avoid evil, one can be prepared against, uh, oh, that one's, I'll leave that for a second, but you know, you want to avoid evil, you know, there's a lot of good thing, you know, things that appear good, but they are really disguises, right? They are wolves in sheep's clothing. Um, you are a young teenager and your friends tell you, oh yeah, smoke this drug, you know, everybody's doing it and it's perfectly fine and you feel great right well a young person could say well my friends I, they wouldn't leave me wrong and if everybody's doing it they're still alive they must be fine and they said it feels great so i want to feel great you know and i want to fit in with my friends and i you know so yeah sure well it might appear good but you know uh it might really be evil right that the, the, that they're have to have some level of caution. You can't just believe everything everyone says. If somebody says, oh yeah, you can do this, there's no consequences. Be cautious, right? <laughs> That's part of being prudent. Prudent would be being cautious, right? 
Um, you know, I always bring up this example of driving with imprudence, but I'll do it again. You know, just because you have a green light doesn't mean you should just fly through it without paying attention. It's still good to be aware of your situation and maybe look, you know, as you're still driving with your foot on the gas pedal, give a quick glance to make sure nobody's going through a red light, right? Particularly if the light has just changed, right? Just because the light changed and you have the green light doesn't mean somebody is not running through uh, the end of their yellow light and driving through a red light, right? You should have caution. Uh, just because it says it's good, it doesn't mean it is good. Um, and lastly, the part of caution, that third part, um, and it's response to objection three, and I think it's an important one. Uh, one can be prepared against the prize of chance uh, and so as to suffer less harm, right? This really ties in well with foresight and circumspection. You know, there are things that we are not prepared for. Um, as I'm filming this video, we are towards the, what we think is the end of a pandemic. We might be surprised, maybe it's not, um, but we think it's to the end of a pandemic. And we've been dealing with a lot of issues you know, people with dealing with sending out stimulus checks and things like this. And, uh, you know, and we're dealing with also a society in a time where most people can't afford to miss more than two paychecks before they become homeless, right? The people are living paycheck to paycheck. So there's no, there's no cushion, right? Uh, ironically, people do have you know, new Apple phones and new, you know, people have a certain amount of things that they, you know, go out to eat and stuff, but they really are living paycheck to paycheck. Um, if one were cautious, one would put aside, you know, three months, six months of savings, um, just in case, right? It, not because you can see something coming, right? Maybe some people did, but most of us did not see a global pandemic coming. It was not on the radar, right? It might be up there with zombie apocalypse. You know, Bill Gates maybe he knew it, but most of us were being pretty unaware of it. But having that money set aside would have been useful for a, a lot of us because maybe it wouldn't have been a pandemic. Maybe it would have been hurricane or an earthquake or a terrorist attack or a famine or an economic collapse. You know, there, there could have been hundreds of things that could have occurred where a buffer of money would have been a very helpful. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we are people who are not particularly good at being cautious, right? If we were more cautious, uh, we would be more prepared for surprises, right? have this idea. We live paycheck to paycheck and this comes up, then it's like, well, we need somebody to help us out. Well, not just us individually, but even large corporations, right? Billion dollar corporations need to be bailed out. Well, why weren't they prepared, <laughs> right? Didn't they have caution? Didn't they have something to prepare for a surprise just in case? Perhaps it's just not within our culture to be more prepared, more cautious. So in conclusion, <sighs> memory uh, is knowledge of the past, uh, understanding is knowledge of the present, docility is teachableness, uh, how teachable are you, knowledge from teaching, shrewdness is knowledge from discovery or experience, uh, reason is the proper use of knowledge, right, reason isn't about having the knowledge but using the knowledge in a useful, re reasonable way. Uh, foresight is very closely connected with prudence because it's foreseeing what's coming. It's uh, the right order uh, of, of what befits an end, right? Uh, how, how do you get to the end? What, what's coming to get to there? Uh, circumspection is aware of circumstances um, and caution uh, avoids obstacles. So with that, we are done uh, with uh, this uh, quasi-integral parts of justice, and we move on to, in the next topic, the subjective forms, subjective parts of, of prudence. I think I said justice, prudence we're dealing with. Okay.